when we started our journey back in 2018, we looked at where we were starting from and we were really pushing against a business that had been market led. So lots of the processes, lots of the configuration was really focused on this is serving this particular country, but it does not serve this other country in the same way. So we had the main SAP systems, but we had multiple processes. From the documentation, we were able to really consolidate into the finance library, which is something we created as a central repository for all of our documentation. We had more than 450 SOPs that we could actually call SOPs, but the quality and the content of those was quite variable. Some was good, not enough, unfortunately. So we needed to look at what our starting point was. We needed to really build a catalog and a landscape of order to cash. What should it look like? How do we actually develop that? So we engaged our operations teams. They'd been operating these processes for near enough 10 years and doing a very good job based on what AstraZeneca was actually asking them to do with what we provided. So fragmented processes or tasks with limited amounts of documentation, but the shared service centers were still delivering by hook or by crew, but they were still delivering. So we engaged our operations team to extract the knowledge they had of why they did what they did the way they did it. And we started to build these through process workshops. So I traveled around all of the different shared service centers to host workshops that allowed us to build process maps, build our process taxonomy, and really start to focus people's attentions on how a process should work from an end to end within a particular process. And that allowed us to also understand and determine where we had deviations in those processes as well. I'll come back to that in a few slides. So we created our business process maps and then we returned to the shared service centers individually after we'd created the standard process maps to start and build those global SOPs and then start to understand and capture the reasons why we had those different deviations within the process. So by the time we got to to 2021, we'd reduced the number of SOPs to align with those standard processes that we created. So we had about 47 global processes at that time and 22 local SOPs. So these were really defined local processes that were specific to either countries that needed to be supported or local fiscal regulation, which meant that that's what was necessary in that particular country. One of them notably for this presentation was the deductions process for the US, for example. So by building and establishing those processes, process documentation, we needed to make sure we had a good enough governance process around that to control the process going forward. So as as we moved on to the next step in the process, we looked at the standard framework that we have. The standard framework applies to all of the process towers. So the process taxonomy that I talked about was really important because that was kind of setting out your stall. This is how we see our process and these are the components of that process. And there may be handoffs into other process areas, but we we were able to actually define and record where those handoffs were. And that then enabled us to go and have those conversations with those other ancillary or interdependent process areas. So we created the library, as I mentioned earlier, of the documentation. We call it the finance library. And I do get a little concerned when audit the cash is referred to as the finance process, because I think all of us involved in audit the cash understand just how much part of the process is operations, supply chain, logistics, and product fulfillment, for example. So there's a lot of other process areas that we touch. When we look at the process documentation, what we also wanted to do within this area was make sure that the process documentation was accessible and consumable. And the finance library was really important to that. We used a solution called Dozuki, which allowed us to create SOPs in a much more interactive fashion. And that's been part of our success as well. So supporting information was created, which was training material. And then we actually all have our process homepage within the organization. So if you want to find out something out about audit the cash, we have our own homepage, which links to our area process taxonomy and the finance library. And it means that people have always got somewhere to go to, to actually understand understand this is what ordered cash is about this is where it fits within the business and then when they actually want to interact with order the cash and understand okay well how do i improve or suggest improvements then we have some systems that allow us to enable the users to create suggestions that would allow us to either improve those sops or to change the process in its entirety when we do that we also identify okay well what are the improvements that we can make And how do we actually focus on those? Many of the discoveries that we make were kind of through some of those eye-opening moments, eye-watering moments to some through the uh, the standardization process that we went through. And this was really where we thought, well, I can't believe that in 2018 as it was, or 2019, when we were going through the, the standardization with shared service centers, do we really do that? Why do we do that? And this gave us a really opportunity to challenge some of that and also make sure that we had a comfortable environment for the people who were operating those processes to share the reasons why 
ways it done this way. And it, again, it's kind of the migration from that market-led or country-led focus to a process-led focus. We also saw the need to introduce a number of metrics into the process to manage both process health and our uh, KPIs that most of you would be familiar with. But we broke the process area down in, into two areas. And Susie mentioned this earlier, order to invoice and invoice to cash. That allows us to focus, you know, particularly when you talk about SAP, for example, where you have that broken down into the two distinct modules within SAP, it really allowed a focus on both of those areas where we have much more distinct measurements around it. So we will also identify through this process a number of manual processes that I would not necessarily expect to see in 2018 and 2020. And that's maybe coming from a background where I've worked in FMCG and CPG in the past, where it's really been about efficiency and small margins. So we identified two areas being cash application and order entry, where we looked for automation of those manual processes. We also identified through this process of standardization that we had lots of manual interventions. The graph that you see in the top right hand corner of here this donut shows some of the focus areas that we're able to bring by identifying okay well what do we change manually what are we actually tampering with in the process rather than putting information in at the order entry stage and letting it flow out at an invoice and a collections process so we were able to identify a lot of that with some of the process analysis and process health indicators as well as the process mining that we did as a result throughout this transformation journey we focus really on performance and outcomes from the shared service centers. So we moved more to collections efficiency rather than collection to terms. We tend to focus less on DSO, not so much the, the fact that the business doesn't focus on DSO, but from a shared service center environment, how much influence a, a collector could have over DSO is reasonably small, particularly when you consider that they're collecting on, on the terms that are agreed, they're not influencing the permitting terms. So that's why we focus more on collection efficiency and applied cash was also something that we focused focused on as well. And turnaround time, so how long does it actually take us to complete a particular process with either the number of people or the cost for that particular service or process that's responsible for that. And we also started to focus on straight through processing. So as, as again, it's you know, making sure that we get some form of resilience in that order to cash process. I think that's something that's become much more apparent or much more urgent to organizations over the past two years. We kind of started that journey before that, not that we knew that the pandemic was coming, but we were kind of ahead of the curve and as much as we we're starting to prepare for the fact that we needed to be much more resilient we needed to be much more reliant or have a level of straight through processing and we needed to make sure we had process ad adherence as well so as far as the processes in the past are concerned when we start to standardize we want to make sure that those processes are actually followed as well so some process adherence was in there to make sure that we could see how people were actually delivering those processes and when we go through that change management process of taking somebody well this is the market led way of doing it. Now this is the process led way of doing that. We needed to help those teams on that journey. So the change management process that we went through was really in engaging with those people in the first instance to create the business process maps. But then when we started to change the processes themselves, some really good knowledgeable people from my team with experience of going through this process before were helping those guys on the journey. So we went through a process of capturing the knowledge of the individuals. And we really went through a process that in simple terms was really to download the knowledge from those people, play it back to them, and then help them on the change journey by changing that process to something that either uses much easier or much more efficient transaction codes within SAP, for example, or changing some of the processes around the tasks they were actually completing that made the process a lot more efficient. So we help them go through an iteration stage of this is what you started with, this is what we think you can work with, and this is what we think you can change, and we believe you can change because we've seen that before. Playing that back to them again and then, and then giving the operations teams that opportunity to add any other flavors to that. So we give them the opportunity to actually have an influence over the process and the standard operating procedure in the end that they were actually going to deliver. And that gave our shared service centers the opportunity to really be part of the change process. So when it comes to to actually training those processes with the rest of the team or any starters and new joiners, then we already had that embedded within the people who've been part of that change process. As we go through that attrition with the shared service centers, as we all know that happens, then that knowledge is retained. So we've got standard processes, we've got the framework, we've got processes that are agreed and that retained. So we were able to make sure that it's actually established. Dozuki was a really good part of that. It was a good solution because it allowed the iteration of processes and process steps to be owned by an author who was one of the process managers from my team who was running that process. So it really allowed us to work a lot more effectively with, with our shared service centers 
in, particularly with our BPO. When we look at working with our BPO, we work with GenPAC. And I have to say that this organization has been a really good supporter of us more than a decade. As I said, they were doing a really good job with the processes that we were asking them to deliver with the framework that was actually being delivered within. The process, as I just mentioned, from that change process with creation of SOPs, it was really part of the first stage of the GFS journey, which was about building one team. So we all saw GenPAC, our BPO, as just part of GFS. They're not an external organization, although in reality, yes, they are. But when they're delivering our processes day to day, then they're part of our team, whether that's a captive or an outsourced shared service center. And we did not treat them any differently. But we also helped along the way by ensuring that the information that we got from our BPO was also able to help us in the captive shared service centers as well. So the whole wider GFS team benefited by all being involved in the standardization process. So it was a very collaborative approach. We also got the support from the senior leadership within Genpact. So that helped to endorse what we were doing and really get the guys on board. So within some of the parts of Genpact, that kind of hierarchical approach is really influential and helpful to making sure that your message lands as the client or the customer of the BPO to get that engagement and make sure we get the support. Throughout this whole process, we identified a lot of processes where they just were no longer required, but because of the nature of BPO, they're not necessarily in a position where they're going to challenge, do I really need to do this anymore? But we were able to help with that and we actually eliminated quite a lot of unnecessary processes that could either be replaced altogether or stopped. While we also addressed the contractual agreement with Genpact throughout this process, it was really to kind of refocus the attention on, okay, let's do this, but let's both benefit from it. And that's how we were able to land that as well, particularly around the standardization and the automation areas of our working relationship. But what has been really, really important is that, you know, throughout this, we celebrated and recognized members of the team. Some of the photographs you see on screen here are of the team that we have in Delhi. This was a really good journey that we went on because at the beginning, people were apprehensive about what was going on. It was going to be a big change. But by going through this process and recognizing people who made good contributions, significant contributions, but have really displayed the attitude and positive collaboration throughout has been really rewarding for us, but also for the BPO. Um, and we had a lot of fun throughout it, despite some of the challenges we had along the way. But that's also a support of a lot of these guys in, in their personal development as well. We've seen a lot of people that have progressed in the organization as a result of the journey that they've been through. This really allowed us to focus on that real focus on we've got people, we've got process, we've got technology, and we want to make that thing work in harmony. If we look at driving out waste within our business, one of the main areas that I focus on is non-linear cost of process. So we want to make sure that we've got a process that has a level of elasticity city in it without growing the cost of that. So we want to improve business outcomes and be a trusted business partner, have a high performance culture and really continue to demonstrate that we're actually focusing on continuous improvement. But we need to move towards that delivering solutions. So using lean methodologies, that kind of thought process to continuous improvement, but making sure that we address those deviations in process that we highlight through the standardization process, system deviations. So if you've got configuration that's not necessary anymore, or we can find a way of using core SAP to support it, then we do that as well. But it's really also about identifying those automation opportunities as well. And process mining has been a really significant part of this as well, allowing us to identify those continuous improvement opportunities, but also help us build those business cases for the automation opportunities as well. So when we look at the automation solutions that we were aiming to leverage globally, which has been really the approach, what I wanted to do following the discovery that we've made through standardization and the process knowledge that we've built was looking around making those kind of big leaps. As I'd mentioned, as an organization, we'd not necessarily focused on investing in this part of the business in the past, but we needed to make some big leaps forward. So High Radius was identified as one of the main solutions that can enable us to do this. And this was really focusing on resilience and process mobility because of it being a cloud-based solution that would allow us to plug into that wherever we are. But it also allowed us to address one of the main focus areas, which was cash application, to do that on a global basis. But as many of you know, that the High Radius solution also has a modular approach. So whether you use cash application and deductions as we do, or you expand that to collections, the EIPP platform or the credit risk area or others that High Radius offer, then that is something that appealed to us because of the number of business models that we have. We have about five or six main business models. Not every one of those business models needs to use every one of those or any of those, those modules that High Radius offer. But what we can do from it being a cloud solution is we could really see the scale of plugging into that 
that solution. So we could use collections in some markets. We could use deductions in one or two as we use it in the US today. And cash application, as I mentioned, we could use globally. So it would enable us to leverage that solution on a global basis, but also to keep our system architecture relatively simple. Another back office process that I mentioned as well was really to address the tail end of order processing or order entry. So a lot of our orders come through via EDI, which many businesses do these days, but we also have a fairly stagnant volume of orders that continue to be processed manually that we were aiming to address with the Alemega solution as well. Combined with that, we were also looking at the use of the Microsoft Power Platform, which we've used for some of our workflow solutions that have enabled us to deliver pre-approved or complete requests to our shared service centers so, so they can actually be processed on receipt rather than be triaged and be received via email or other solutions into the shared service center. So that's allowed us to create a real simple architecture and we want to try and limit ourselves to real cloud solutions with the view that the fact that, you know, as we will need to migrate to S4 HANA in the future, we want to do that without any regret cost or with limited regret cost. So it's really by making those decisions to let's keep it simple and make sure that it works for the order to cash process as we see it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, being good enough rather than best in class may be sufficient, but we need to create the capacity within our process areas by investing in these solutions today. And when we look at the other areas, really the GPO team, these are the people who make the magic happen in my area of business. As a GPO, I report into the VP for GFS who reports the, to the CFO of our business. So it's a fairly flat structure. Within my team, I have global process owners that, as I mentioned, cover the order to invoice and invoice the cash part of the process. I also cover some of the banking processes as well. We have somebody that's dedicated to our process governance, somebody who focuses on analytics and metrics and really kind of analyzing and drawing out of the business what we need and what we should be measuring, as well as somebody who actually looks after, you know, adding the oil to the engine, kind of making sure that things happen as by addressing some of the master data and data attribute challenges that we have that allow our either our core SAP processes or our automated processes to work more effectively. And then we have somebody who takes care of really coordinating a lot of the projects across the whole of the audit cash process and our continuous improvement focus and a solution that we use to consolidate and collect those continuous improvement ideas 